Hi, everybody. I'm Karen Hartglass. You're listening to It's All About Food. I really can't wait to get started with today's interview. But first, I wanted to make a few announcements. Are you familiar with the Coalition for Healthy School Food? They're a wonderful organization in New York doing great things for children, healthy children. They're having their virtual gala this year. It used to be in a physical event, but thanks to COVID, it's virtual, and that means more people can take advantage of it. It's called Taking Root, Growing Healthy Kids Virtual Gala 2021. It's October 28th from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time. But what I want to bring to your attention is during their gala event, they have a silent auction. I just wanted to let you know about the auction in case you want to help support a really great organization and get something wonderful at the same time in return. I just found out they added tickets to the Billie Eilish Happier Than Ever The World Tour. And there are so many other things, small and large, that you can take advantage of. So I invite you to check out the healthyschoolfood.org gala, healthyschoolfood.org. I will list links on this page, and I hope you take advantage of their wonderful auction items for this event. It ends on October 28th at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time, so that means you need to hurry over there and see what they have and what you might want to take advantage of. Have you been influenced by anyone in your life? We've all been influenced by many different people, our parents, friends, family, teachers. My next guest has influenced millions of people, including myself, Francis Moore LePay. Francis Moore LePay is the author or co-author of 20 books about world hunger, living democracy, and the environment, beginning with the 3 million copy Diet for a Small Planet in 1971. She has been featured on the Today Show, Hardball, with Chris Matthews, Fox and Friends, The Wall Street Journal, NPR, the CBC, and BBC, and other news outlets. Francis is the co-founder of three organizations, including the Oakland-based think tank Food First and the Small Planet Institute, which she leads with her daughter, Anna LePay. The pair also co-founded the Small Planet Fund, which channels resources to democratic social movements worldwide. Okay, everybody, take a deep deep breath. We are here today celebrating the 50th anniversary edition of Diet for a Small Planet. Uh, I'm just getting chill saying that. And I am very honored to have the author of that book with me, Francis Moore LePay. Thank you. Thank you for joining so me. Very, very much. I am one of the millions of people you have influenced. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and before we get into um, your book and your work, I, I just wanted to start with a little story. So in 1971, I was 13 years old. I'm not a religious person today, but I was raised Jewish and uh, my parents didn't really do everything right, in my opinion, with the religion because there were rules to follow and I wanted to learn about them. So I went to Hebrew school. I had a bat mitzvah and I was required to give a talk and I didn't I was not a speaker at 13 years old and I don't have a copy of it. I wish I did. But the burning question I had or the thought I wanted to share with everyone is Why are people hungry? Why are there hungry people on this planet? And I looked at all at all my family, my friends, all of these adults, like, how are you letting this happen? Mm -hmm. And I really didn't understand. And then I read Diet for a Small Planet, and all the answers were there. Now, I have to say, all of those answers weren't necessarily comforting, because there there were a lot of things wrong with our world. But the The part that did bring me comfort, of course, is your continual underlying theme of hope and that we have to do the work. And I guess that's what I've been doing for the rest of my life after that turning point. So your book, once again, affected one other of the millions, and I'm grateful for that, for providing not just answers or reasons, but way to figure things out. And learning how to ask the right questions. 
and these are the themes that have um that have played up in my life my entire adult life so who thank you for that and here we are 50 years later <laughs> Wow, it, it seems as though we have a great deal in common. Oh my goodness, I, I just got teary when you said that was your first question yeah. at age 13. That was my first question at age 26 that, you know, how could it be that the first thing every species does is feed itself, feed its offspring, that's it, you know, that's our main goal. And we, the brightest species, are not doing it. So that was like the no duh for me. If I could just, if I could just understand why people are hungry in the world, that would unlock the mysteries of economics and politics, and I would have a pathway. And that was what, at in my twenties, you know, we all are looking for what is my pathway. And so I was just really moved. Nobody's ever introduced me <laughs> and shared that. Oh, I had the same question you did at the same time. So that's right. beautiful. Well, that's thank beautiful. you. I'm glad you got there else. a lot younger age than I did, though. <laughs> I have to give you credit. I just don't know why everyone doesn't ask that question. And some people may, but then they just they just get yeah. on with their life. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to the next thing I want to, or the first thing I want to talk about. Um, I read your book, the 50th anniversary edition. I want to say that I read the first, and I read the 10th. <laughs> I didn't read the 20th and I loved the introduction to the 20th that you included in the 50th. That was just okay. one very powerful piece. You said in your book, it's in your, my journey section, I believe. Yeah. Where it took hundreds and hundreds of years to create the web of assumptions and the unchallenged institutions of exploitation and privilege that people take for granted today. It will take a very long time to create new structures based on different values. But rather than belittling our task, this realization, seeing ourselves as part of a historical process longer than our lifetimes, I'm going to repeat that, longer than our lifetimes, can be a source of courage. And I want to develop this a little bit more, but I, I also wanted to mention uh, Jim Mason, and you noted him in your book as a co-author of Animal Factories, and I love his book, An Unnatural Order, where he said it was like 10,000 years, not just hundreds of hundreds, where we created mm -hmm. all of these assumptions that are like coded into our DNA today that have created so much uh, misfortune. The only thing I would differ from you, I wouldn't say DNA, coded okay. into our mindset, which, um, you know, that's been the theme song of my life too, as you know, that that we create the world not as it is, but as we are, as the, the lens through which we see. I, recently, I read that both the Hopi Indians and Plato have said, he who tells the story rules the world. So what is the story that we live by? And that, so I think of it more in that than I do in terms of our DNA. I think our DNA is pretty good. <laughs> But our ideas override, actually, our DNA uh, in, in that sense that we, we're, what's so unique about our species is the power of ideas that um, I often also quote Albert Einstein, who says that it's theory which decides what we can observe. So we all go around with theories of, of the world that we absorb in, without even thinking, and they determine what we see and cannot see. Um, so I, I, I kind of turn the expression around, the common expression of seeing is believing. And I say, no, 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 no. Believing is seeing. And that's really the theme song that carries through just about all of my work. So you're sitting there in the Berkeley basement library at 26 years old, <laughs> and yep. you're doing this research. And I always talk about connecting the dots. And you connected a lot of dots. And do you remember how that happened? Well, I just remember I had, a, I had this question. You see, I had come out of my work as a community organizer during the, in the war on poverty when government was really expressing my values. Hey, fantastic. So I ended up in Philadelphia and uh, was hired as a housing inspector. But my real job was to go door to door to organize welfare recipients, recipients to stand up for their rights, for their dignity, because 
life was extremely hard for them. And so I came out of that experience asking why. Why did my best friend in that group die in her early 40s? Lily died. I was convinced not by a heart attack, but by the stress of poverty. And I had to go to the root of Lily's death. And so that was the, the, the motive. And then I had the great blessing. And I don't, I don't really um, recognize this among, enough, but I had the blessing of being married to someone who enabled me, then we could live on one postdoc salary of $7,000. <laughs> uh, so a lot of things allowed me then, and Mark's work, Mark LePay's work at the university allowed me to have access to all the library in the university mm. and also the time because we could live on his salary. Thank you, Mark. You know, Thank you, <laughs> the society that enabled us to live well on $7,000 a year. So my only point is that my point is that I had this burning question coming out of this 1960s experience of feeling like, oh yeah, I'm going to get be part of the war on poverty and the new great society and all of that. And then realizing that I had to go deeper to understand why all this poverty was creating this needless suffering and the death of my friend. And so that was that big why. And uh, and of course, that was the moment of uh, that the population bomb exploded. Uh, a book called Famine 1975 came out in the 60s then, predicting that there would be global famine within just a few years, less than a decade. And so the culture, especially women who I respected, some were saying, I can't have children. It would be unethical because we don't, we don't have the resources. You were one of those. <laughs> Yeah, and, and um, so I, I just felt like that was the question. It, was, it seemed so obvious that food, if, we don't, if we're not eating, what else matters, right? If we can't feed ourselves, you know, what else matters? And that that would unlock the mysteries of economics and politics, as I often say. So I took my dad's slide rule, <laughs> and I still have it in the leather case, and uh, a friendly librarian helped me wander through the stacks. And of course, then, as you know, I put the numbers together and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, there is no scarcity of food, that we humans are actively creating the experience of scarcity for millions of people out of plenty and vastly more. Because actually, as you know, what really shook me up, uh, now there's so many more things wrong with our food system, but then what really shook me up was the waste, the inefficiency. I called it the protein factory in reverse because we're feeding such vast resources to livestock as we still are, and more so worldwide, that return to us only a tiny fraction of what they eat. As I'm sure you know, for uh, all the calories that we feed beef in the form of feed, we get about 3% in the form of calories in our food. I mean, it's wildly inefficient. So that was that was the beginning. You have a very special quality where not only do you ask questions and dig for the answer, but you're asking different questions. You're not asking the obvious questions. And I guess there's some loop there where you ask a question and then find information and that leads you to other questions. Well, the highest compliment or one of my favorite compliments, I should say, ever was somebody said to me, Frankie, this is a dear friend. And she said, Frankie, you know what I love about your work? You ask the question behind the question and keep going to the question behind that question. And I said, yeah, that seems to make sense, right? So it seemed, again, an obvious thing, you know, that, and, and that's been my whole life, right, Karen, you know, this, what is the question behind that question? And I'm still there, you know, today, yeah. 50 well, years later, I'm still trying to do that. Not everybody does that. So but that, I, that I is a people... wonderful <laughs> talent or skill or burning desire. It's good. <laughs> And it sure is a lot easier now with the internet. Just for all you young people listening to this, imagine where I couldn't push a button on my computer, but I actually had to go to the basement library miles away from my home and get help in putting the paper together and 
and uh, using my dad's slide rule to do the calculation. So it's certainly not easier now to ask the big questions. I'm, I'm thinking about that. I was thinking about this morning before we started talking about how, how did you do all this work without the internet? And I think to myself, how did I do the work that I did without the internet? There are just things, I don't know how we did them, but we did. And in some ways, maybe there was a benefit to not have the internet. I, I think it's, certainly we didn't get instant answers. So it required a lot more devotion to the search, right? Because mm -hmm. we had to really work for it and we had to get help. As I, I so regret that I didn't get back to the UC Berkeley library to thank, like, thank that librarian before she passed. Mm -hmm. So I think she was happy that you were doing what <laughs> you were doing. Yeah. Well, so you also talk about experts. There are a lot of people on this planet and more and more universities are really concentrating specific skills to have a specific title, to go into a specific career. It's being more and more refined. Mm -hmm. We have these experts that apparently know everything about a subject and yet, and, and they can be intimidating because if we're interested in something and then we're with an expert, um, and I just want you to know that you are an expert right now. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Die for a Small Planet. But putting that aside, um, you wrote that experts are kind of limited because of their training. And we really shouldn't be intimidated by them if we're coming from a space where we have questions mm -hmm. and passion because they don't know everything. Absolutely, and I have two points here that I think are so important that I haven't expressed recently. And one is um, what I've come to call the power of fresh eyes. In mm -hmm. fact, we gave, a, we gave a little award to one of our interns years ago called the Fresh Eyes Prize because he came in to the project when this was a book on world hunger and he came into the project in the middle and realized that one uh, chart that we were creating was based on a false, under, false understanding of the data. Mm. And uh, we didn't recognize until he came in with fresh eyes and looked at it. And we had jumped over certain assumptions because we thought it was all set. So I think the great value of being, um, being not being a quote unquote specialist <laughs> is that we come into a, a big question with these fresh eyes. And that's what allowed me to write Diet for a Small Planet because all that data was there for any of the experts in development e economics or nutrition. Anyone could have done that, what I did, you know, but they weren't asking that question because they were already narrowed down or, you know, mm -hmm. telescoped down to a, to a smaller question and not asking the biggest question. So I think that, and then I wanted to quote a friend of mine, Marty Strange, who in the 1980s was head of an organization called the Center for Rural Affairs in Nebraska. And um, I just adore him. And um, he said, he, I remember standing in my kitchen, he said, Frankie, he said, everybody has a choice, you know, and who's, who's um, pursuing knowledge. You either become a um, specialist and can be pretty certain you'll get something right, but it won't have a lot of meaning. <laughs> Or you can be a generalist and ask the biggest questions and be pretty sure you're going to get something wrong. But the impact of your work can be much greater, you know, so you have to, he was trying to encourage me when I was, I guess, just obsessing about a possible mistake. I don't even think it was an actual one, but he was trying to encourage me that, look, Frankie, it goes with the territory. If you are a generalist asking the biggest questions, of course, you'll get something wrong at some point. But you just keep learning and keep acknowledging that, yeah, I got that wrong, but and now it'll go into my big picture work. So I, I really loved both of those um, those insights, the fresh eyes <laughs> rationale for coming into an area where you aren't a trained specialist, and also the idea that um, by at, to be a generalist, you have to take risks because you can't be a specialist in everything that has to go into that big picture. This is something that people need to learn in school. I mean, there's so many things that 
<laughs> need to change in terms of education and how children are raised, but to be able to number one, respect those who have the training, mm -hmm. but also to know that our ideas are valid and we shouldn't be afraid to present them and shouldn't be afraid to have a conversation with an expert on any subject. I, I know it saved my life. I had advanced ovarian cancer in 2006 and I was looking for all the best doctors I could find to save my life. And I was lucky because I'm connected in this alternative health movement and I know a lot of wonderful people who helped me. Um, oh, but there were good. times I had conversations with doctors telling them things that they didn't think of, they didn't know. Mm -hmm. Now, certainly I wanted, I, I wanted the best, That's a great example. I wanted the best surgeons, the ones who knew how to cut and sew up and look for things, you know, I wasn't going to do that, <laughs> but there were things that, you know, I needed to help them along with to save my own life. Fresh eyes, right? Fresh eyes. Yeah. Very motivated eyes, right? Because <laughs> you were saving your life. Exactly. So that's, that's fabulous. Good for you. Good for you. So you can identify with what I'm oh, saying here. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's, let's just talk about hunger. I am not hungry. Thank you. Good. <laughs> uh, and uh, I have done a three week water only fast to oh experience. Um, it's supposed to have health benefits, but also to know what hunger feels like. Let's talk about the causes of hunger and what you discovered in 1971. And here we are 50 years later. Mm -hmm. The core insight, I don't think has evolved very far. The core insight is that we um, make the rules, some formal and some just norms that are accepted that end up concentrating power and therefore concentrating access, concentrating, one has to have power, which just means to be able in the Latin root, you know, power to, to be able to meet our basic needs. Um, and if that is highly concentrated as it is in the United States today, let me just put a little asterisk there at the bottom of the page. We talk about inequality, but very few Americans realize that the US is more unequal in economically than in about a hundred countries. We, we don't even, you know, we don't even get close to um, other industrial countries, many other industrial countries. So it's, it's extreme here. Mm -hmm. And we also know just, and I think it's intuitively believable that concentrated economic power can easily translate into concentrated political power. And we have few barriers that really keep that from happening. And so, Increasingly, uh, we have private interests of the most wealthy influencing and shaping our public policies. We have, for example, 20 lobbyists in Washington for every single person that we elect to represent us. So just ima imagine us trying to get an ear while 20 other people are yakking into the other ear. So th that, that can't serve us, that can't create the culture in America that we want. Uh, so that really is the key understanding that I've been trying to uh, figure out how to communicate that in a way that really motivates people rather than devastates people. <laughs> I, I wanna say that despair is our worst enemy, our worst enemy. And that hope, I like to say, hope is not for wimps. Hope is power. <laughs> Hope is power. And without it, then all is lost. And so I, my, my hope <laughs> is that by empowering us with knowledge and with the realization that we can make all these connections with others, because it's very hard. We're so social. You know, I want to say here that you know, often human beings get attacked for being so individualistic and selfish, but no, basically we're pack animals. We are mm -hmm. so social. We're so social that it's very hard for us to separate from the pack and to say, no, 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 you know, <laughs> we're on the wrong track. Uh, we have to take a different path than the majority is headed. And that's very difficult. So courage is then, I'm, I'm 
going on and on here, but courage then has become a central virtue in my in my collection of what is needed. Um, that courage is actually a virtue, like uh, trustworthiness and loyalty. And courage is something we have to cultivate because, it, as I say, because we're such pack animals, <laughs> that it takes it's it's really terrifying to be outside the norm in terms of what we are standing for. This program is called It's All About Food. I talk a lot about food. I'm talking with you, I, I might want to say it's all about democracy, but we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things I do a lot of is helping people move to a healthy whole food plant diet. And I always say it takes courage. It takes courage to change your diet. Mm -hmm. It takes yeah. courage because you have to deal with people, every, everybody all around you <laughs> telling you, why are you doing that? I don't know. Oh, it's yeah. not good, you know, so it takes yeah. courage. You know, when I first wrote the book, uh, Diet for a Small Planet, people would say to me, oh, Frankie, you saved my family because we had so much discord. My parents thought I was going to die from lack of protein. And I was supposed to show them that they could relax. And, and, you know, I think young people today would have a hard time believing that that people really thought that without meat, we couldn't survive, you know. And I grew up in Cowtown, by the way, you know, Fort Worth, Texas. So <laughs> even well, more true. It's it's those little things like that that give me hope, but also give me inspiration to keep going because in some ways we look at the last 50 years and we've learned so much from Diet for a Small Planet about the causes of hunger. And yet we've seen a lot of things get worse, not better. Yeah. Uh, some things are better in that I think there are more people talking about it, more people understanding it, but we have seen a movement towards a better food system. So I take that as positive. Yes. <laughs> I take whatever I can, but let's talk about hope for a minute. And I don't know who, if it was one person or something I read, but I remember people really putting down the word hope and saying okay. that it was meaningless. Right. And, you know, I read it and I was like, okay, there's something to that. But I like your interpretation of hope <laughs> because it keeps us away from despair, but also keeps us going and makes exactly. us realize we're in this for the long term. We may not see what we want to see today or in 50 years. Exactly. So it's not blind hope <laughs> at all. That's not what I mean. I, I, I read a book uh, by a Harvard um, professor, a neuroscientist who said that hope organizes our brains towards solutions. Uh, there you go. That's right there. <laughs> grounds for hope, right? That hope itself helps us see solutions. And so I think that it's really got a bad rap. Hope is really, it's not a salve, you know, oh, you know, you can just relax. No, no, no. It's the motivation that we need to keep going and taking risks. Um, and it's just who we are as humans. We are doers. We are creators. This is the most, I get chills as I say that, but, um, you know, that my three, I have a, two trilogies in my, in my uh, life's message. And one is having to do with, you know, who we are, what, what are the human needs beyond the physical, you know, beyond food and water and air. It, they, they, the need for power, that is, agency, right? The second is the need for meaning, that we have to feel that what we're doing is meaningful. And third, connection with others. And food <laughs> is something that allows us to meet all of those needs through understanding, you know, what is, um, how do we have agency? How do the choices that we make every day ripple out? And how do we model so that others are influenced by us? And how do we speak? So power and meaning. Ah, meaning, yes. You know, every bite I take ripples out the, the effects of that and then connection with others. And I just learned a couple, you probably know this, but I just learned a few years ago that the word companion is from the Latin with bread. So a companion is the, those are the people we break bread with. And of course, you know, food has been the center of our bonding with one another in family, in village, in, you know, in neighborhood and 
in nations. <laughs> um, so power, meaning, and connection is who we are. We and how do we create those conditions for all of us? It's as we believe in that that change is possible, and that's the other word for that is hope. <laughs> you know that, and so that's that's my defense of the idea of hope. Just wanted to add, I I love learning languages. I speak French, and I'm studying German ah. and Spanish, and I think it helps with that I, feeling of community. Oh, it does. When yeah, you learn absolutely. another language and you get the language carries culture. Yes. And yes. I, I just enjoy it so much. And then you can understand words like companion, con pan. <laughs> right. <laughs> so obvious, right? right. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Okay. You have a story and I want you to share it if you can about long grain and short grain rice. <laughs> oh, well, I, I made a joke about it in, in, I guess it must have been the 10th anniversary edition. Yes. But early on, um, you know, I was so desperate to get the core political and economic message out of Diet for a Small Planet. And one of my first speeches, I think it was the University of Michigan. You've read it more recently than I have. <laughs> but um, so the first question I got was, Ms. LePay, what is the difference between long grain and short grain brown rice? And my heart just fell. I thought, come on already. I've been trying to take us to these big, big political and economic questions. And you ask me that. And my answer is one is longer than the other. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, but then what was so sweet is that the person who asked me that question then reached out to me years later and they said, I was the one who asked you that question. I'm so embarrassed that I did. And, and actually your book meant a lot more than me than was reflected in that question. So I forgave him. We, we resolved our, <laughs> our encounter. I love that story. And I got two things out of it. And one is what you were talking about, how you really want to get all this information to people, all these ideas, these big pictures. And some people are just not ready for it. Yeah. They're just not ready or, and they're not able to understand and they have to hear it over and over and over. I don't know what the secret is, but I understand we are all different and we're all getting information on our own way in different times. The other thing is most people know so little about their food, yeah. what it is, how it's grown, where it comes from. How many varieties of rice are there? Right. Really, in our house, we have black rice, we have red rice, we have basmati rice, <laughs> many varieties. And then we have other grains. We have millet and, you know, so th and then the seeds, quinoa and buckwheat. But most people in America are so limited with what they're eating and what they've been trained to eat, that a question, what's the difference between long and short grain rice is really very profound. I yeah. found. Okay, well, I didn't have much of an answer, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I still do believe that food is a powerful, powerful entry point. And um, in, as you, you've you seen how I, you know, that. It is the one thing that we make choices about more than once every day, <laughs> unless we're fasting as you did. Um, and so it's, it's just, I used to use the metaphor of a string around the finger that because it's a daily, multiple times a day, in my case, I'm kind of a grazer. So multiple times a day, you know, I'm making choices that it's just oh, such a natural way to think about one's and to be aware of uh, viscerally one's connection with the people who grew it, the soil it was grown in, um, the insects who fertile, you know, part of the creation of it, and on to, you know, the processing and the treatment of those workers. So I just think it's such, such a powerful way to learn to feel one's connection moment to moment with the rest of the world and the impact of who we are on others. Now let's get to democracy. Okay. Because the message I got from you is that it's all about democracy. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to make change, we the people need to get busy. Right, right, right. And to believe that 
we can get beyond this highly corrupted, limited understanding of democracy. And so um, I one of my theme songs right now on that score is <laughs> um, that we can we have two legs, right? We can walk uh, in tandem feeling part of the democracy movement and part of the food movement, that we can be informed and aware and, and exemplars and communicators about the messages around our food system and what it needs and influence the people that way, even if it's only people we serve or people who know what we choose to eat. And also on democracy, it's not some distant, you know, just for the political scientist and the elected official. It is a living process. I often quote, um, I often quote the first African American appellate judge, William Hasty, who said, democracy is not being, it is becoming. Mm -hmm. It is easily lost, but never finally won. Its essence is eternal struggle. Or as John Lewis would say, good trouble, right? It is exhilarating trouble. It's getting it's getting at the very core of our needs for power, meaning, and connection. Because only democracy that is just defined by distributed power, transparency, and a sense of mutual responsibility, those are my three, that's my other trilogy. Only democracy can meet these deep needs for power, meaning, and connection in our lives. So it's, it's absolutely the only pathway for our species. And I think my, two trilogies, if you will, it, it, they are very much grounded in what anthropologists tell us about who we are, how we evolved in cooperative tribes in which we held each other accountable and things were transparent <laughs> and uh, that we did feel we had a voice and that there was a mutual responsibility that every baby was held by multiple aunties and uncles and grandparents. And mm. there was a real sense that we were in this together. And when meat was eaten, when the hunter made the hunt, made the kill, it wasn't just the hunter's family who ate, the village ate. So there's a lot to go on because those are still our genes, right? And right. That we evolved in, in this tightly knit tribe. And so um, I think that, that that's really what I'm trying to communicate. The word democracy can sound so formal and poli-sci, right? But <laughs> it is what I call living democracy. In the 90s, I created an organization that lasted for you know, about eight years called the Center for Living Democracy. And I still use that term, as you know, in the book, because of that hasty feeling it is a living process. Um, uh, never, never completed, always a journey, the journey of democracy. And it is the human journey is my, is my claim. So, um, so back to the food movement and the democracy movement. So so quite a number of years ago, or at least twice I've made this vow <laughs> in my life. One was when I started the center in the early 90s, I vowed, okay, you know, I'm going to go beneath hunger to the root cause of the, the anti-democracy going on and to address democracy. And then I ended up going back into food and wrote a number of food related books but um, in 2016, I marched from Philadelphia to Washington, DC, when I thought I could only walk, I don't know, a few miles, I walked 100 miles. And that experience of stepping up literally for democracy. And by the way, what we sat on the Capitol steps for and got arrested for in 2016, those are the very calls that are now embedded in the Voting Rights Act, in the, in the, um, um, you know, in the John Lewis <laughs> bill that is now, you know, before Congress. So it's not too bad. We got that far. So I, all I'm saying is that I've learned that, you know, I don't have to, to make a choice that I can, I, I can weave these two passions in my life. And so we, so our Small Planet Institute sponsors more than one website. We're also the founder with an organization called Democracy Initiative, a huge uh, coalition organization representing 45 million Americans. 
uh, we've created a website called democracymovement.us. And it's a really easy way to find out what's going on in your state and to get motivated because we, we have a lot of the, some of the best writing to, to keep, um, really motivate us to keep going. So um, I guess it's that, you know, I, I laugh about Gerald Ford. Uh, a lot of people too young to remember this, but there was a joke about him that he, he yes, he could chew gum and, and walk at the same time. I don't know what the joke was, but I can do democracy and do food, maybe not, yeah, in the same moment, in the same moment. So um, this idea that, that, that we don't have to make these, these bifurcations, that we can see the linkages and sometimes part of our lives we're more focused in one than another. But even if you know, we're really just in the food movement, we can still be aware enough to plug in at critical moments for the democracy movement. And so I'm going to try um, to just doing this dance, you know, just weaving uh, my life uh, with these threads. When Joe Biden was running for president, or maybe when he had won, I'm not sure the time frame, but some friends of mine on Facebook were putting together a dream list of his cabinet. And somebody asked me, who would I want for secretary of agriculture? And I went, Francis Moore LePay, oh, it's wow. obvious. <laughs> oh man, I never heard that. Whoa, that's pretty cool. <laughs> but, we got Tom, but we got Tom Vilsack instead. <laughs> yes. Again. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I know you've, you've made a tremendous difference on this planet to so many people and your work is best as you are doing it, writing your books and doing your organizations, but you, have you ever thought about politics? No, I really haven't. I, I haven't because I feel that we, it is best to go with our strengths, you know, and, and, and I guess my, huh, <laughs> I, I guess I've just been so captivated with this idea of the, of the power of ideas Mm -hmm. And how do I change the fundamental assumptions um, in order to have different policies rather than being the one to try to implement the policies? I, I think I've made a good choice and I think it's probably too late to run for office. <laughs> well, I wish he had appointed you as secretary of agriculture. <laughs> that we would, that have seen would have been some... a pretty amazing. I could not have turned that down for sure. For sure. Okay, that's good to know. I would not have turned that down. But then I'd have to bring my daughter in as my assistant uh, secretary, but that would be okay. Uh, probably my son too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I want to just give a shout out to my daughter, Anna Lepe, um, because she has been so incredibly helpful in so many points in my life. But she really took charge of uh, up dating the recipes in the new 50th anniversary edition and getting on board these, these top chefs in the uh, world of plant eating. And so she deserves tremendous credit for this beautiful new book. And it is beautiful, by the way. <laughs> it, it is beautiful. I read it and uh, of course I was reading it and thinking, this is all so familiar. <laughs> <laughs> But it's familiar because I had read it before, but also because all of these ideas are now are, are really accepted in so many arenas. It's going to take a long time to get changed, but you have really planted seeds and the trees are growing. Thank you. Yes, I, I really do see that. And I see, as I'm sure you agree, that the climate crisis is going to speed this trans has to speed this transition up because um, the, our, we've learned that as much as 37% of greenhouse gas emissions are related to our food system. And a huge part of that is livestock as you know, the direct emissions, but also the felling of very important biodiversity centers in the rainforests of the world are being destroyed in order to produce livestock. So, so I think the kick in the pants, if you will, um, that can move us along faster is the climate crisis right now. I just wonder how much people have to suffer before they act. Yeah. And I, I, 
would rather they don't have to suffer as much, uh, well, suffer more. Because we're seeing, we're seeing it now and we're not acting fast enough. So it has to hurt a little more, I think. Yes. And I hope that people listening to us, I just so appreciate your questions. This is one of my favorite interviews I've done. Thank you. Um, (laughs) But I hope that people hear, and I think they hear it in your voice because I hear it in your voice and I hope they hear it in mine, that we aren't wagging fingers. You know, we are not saying, oh, this is a, you should, I, well, this is a we can, we will. This is, this is, we're talking about calling out the joyful parts of us, the part that really needs to be expressed because it is our humanity to, our humanity is to come to the world and make it better for our offspring, you know? That's what every generation has attempted. And uh, now the stakes are so high that um, we are calling people to discover that point of joy that point of hope in action that is really the heart of the good life. Can we talk about one more thing? I, sure. uh, excuse me, you mentioned it last night and it's something that's been burning inside of me for a while. And that's the racism in our food system. In your book, you talked about the soul fire farms and what I've been learning about black history in this country and how it's affected agriculture <laughs> The Africans were good enough to work as slaves to grow food in the South, but for some reason they haven't been given the respect or the fairness to grow their own food or food for other people on their own farms. I just thought I'd ask more from you on that. Well, I was shocked. I mean, I thought I was generally aware, but I don't have the exact number in my head. Maybe you do, but that that, um, a few decades ago that African-Americans still held a significant percentage of our farmland. And then it just has been totally um, taken away um, because our economic system driven by this highest return to existing wealth. And now it's a tiny fraction of what they had before. Um, And so these efforts like Soulfire Farm to really acknowledge the tremendous contribution of the people who were brought here enslaved and yet contributed so much to what we now have in farming. And I I tell the story that just makes me tear up, but uh, Leah Penniman, who was the founder, who is the founder of Soul Fire Farm, she said her great grandmother uh, take or great, great um, taken in slave ships here before she was loaded on, she wove the seeds of her native African soils into her hair. She wove the seeds into her hair so that she would have them when she got to this mysterious new place that she was being stolen to live in. And I just thought that was so, that that image, that that foresight, you know, as I think, wow, that's incredible Mm -hmm. foresight and inner inner strength to be able to, you'd think people would be so terrified that they couldn't even think straight and to have the presence of mind to do that and the implications for her family and and <laughs> all of us. So I, um, I believe, or I want, I believe in kind of, I want to believe that we are in an era of reckoning that, um, is long overdue we you know i think of my youth as you know when we first passed the civil rights laws that protected people's um right to uh participate in everything from you know going into the department store in my hometown to to voting and all so that we've from my youth to today we've cleared the legal battles and yet because of the extreme racism in which was you know, foundational in our country that those who have been harmed by it and limited by it still, you know, they have a fraction, tiny fraction of the, of the wealth per family that whites do. So we have a long way to go. <laughs> and, and I think just start with acknowledging that and then, um, and then, in any way we can reach out to friends and neighbors who maybe have been taken in by this now new bugaboo, you know, this new 
thing around critical race theory, which is all made up as far as I'm concerned. It's just about, oh yeah, right. We <laughs> built in racism is built into our system. So every what that's not a new, not a new message. So um I I just hope that um that we can get even, you know, have more strength, more um, ability to talk about and to act in ways that are anti-racism, you know, um, and with with that with ease, you know, without feeling as if, um, yeah, and to recognize the progress we have made, and yet to acknowledge how far we have to go. Both. You mentioned the recipes, mm -hmm. and I want to thank Anna too. I. I knew her when she lived in New York, and I miss her. Hi, Anna. Thank you for all your great work. The crunchy granola was the recipe for me back in the late 70s. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I know you've updated a few of them. I, yeah. My personal diet today, I'm a vegan, and I really limit my salt and oil and sugar. And uh, I don't add oil to my granolas when I make granola. It's okay. We've, we've really evolved in the 50 years in terms of our knowledge about nutrition and what we should and should be eating. And it's fun to see that the recipes evolve with us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, all of the recipes, the original recipes have been spruced up and been modernized for the 21st century. Uh, one of the jokes that Anna and I laugh about still, as she said, to me a year ago, mom, do you realize that in your original recipes, there were 70 references to margarine? <laughs> because that's when, that's when we were terrified, you know, that we were being told that, that animal fat, you know, any kind of, 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 right. of uh, um, was terrible for us. So margarine was the answer. Of course, now we know that it was the sugar industry uh, propaganda that was diverting us uh, because they wanted us to focus on fat animal fat instead of on sugar as the enemy. So I, I fell for that, but. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we all fell for a lot of things. So much. But all the margarine is gone now. It's all uh, vegetable oil. Now. Yes, yes. Well, ideally we should be getting our macronutrients, protein, carbohydrates, and fat from whole foods, minimally Absolutely. processed. Yes. Absolutely. It's easy and it's delicious. It, it sure is. And it's where, you know, I keep telling people <laughs> there is no sacrifice here because the plant world is where all the diversity, the color, the texture, the taste, it's, it's just magnificent <laughs> uh, variety and you can never get bored with it. I mean, for me, that shift away from meat was just totally fun. And I stopped having to count calories. You know, I was back then, mm -hmm. You know, we all had to count calories, and I, I really, literally, I would, I would add them up during the day in my head and, and obsess about it. And then, oh, all that gone, I could just eat whatever I wanted to eat, and my weight was right. just where I wanted it, it to be. It is freedom. It is yep. freedom. And okay, I could talk to you forever, and I'm going to let <laughs> you go. But this, this concept of freedom uh, is so important. And you, in the book, you talk about boundaries, and I. I wanted to bring this up and now I'm glad I'm remembering, but we need boundaries in order to be free to some yeah. extent. Absolutely. There's not a, there's not an either or there's not an either or because, you know, we, because, you know, to create norms that are life serving gives us freedom to live the way we want to live healthier, more, um, harmonious lives so freedom is an abstract concept doesn't work for me it's what it's what enables us to fulfill ourselves are the best in our humanity that's what is the only meaningful freedom for me just the abstract idea of doing anything you want to do no 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 freedom is being able to fulfill my deepest needs for power meaning and connection and therefore freedom requires norms and rules that keep what widely distributed, that keep wealth widely distributed, and that keep political power answering to the citizens. Hey, what a concept. So the, there have to be rules. And, and of course, today with the pandemic, 
you know, the, what is the general welfare? We're called in our preamble to our constitution says that we founded this nation so that we could promote the general welfare. That was a founding, it's the preamble to the constitution, right? And how can we promote the general welfare unless there is a sense of mutual responsibility among all of us and unless we're willing to follow the rules and norms that promote that and so I think about today idea of people no I, I'm not going to get a vaccine because I prize my freedom <laughs> what freedom is there if one is sick and and dies right uh, what freedom is there to know that you might be infecting someone else that doesn't free my spirit it doesn't free my activity um, to know that. So anyway, yes, you're right. I, I freedom it out of context of a democracy is really a very, very limited and dangerous concept. There we go. Well, I'm going to let you go now. Okay. <laughs> I just can't tell you how impressed I am with you. Well, I can't well, overstate it. I can tell you, but I can't overstate it. Thank you. So well, this is you just because I kind of got up on the wrong side of the bed today and I was, it's very gloomy here. I guess it is there too. And uh, so I was really working hard to get up my energy for this interview and you made it very easy. Thank you very much. I'm sending you a big hug. <laughs> oh, likewise to you. Okay. Francis, Francis, I hope, Mor Francis I hope, Morlope, author of the 50th anniversary diet for a small planet. My great, great honor and pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. That was Francis Moore LePay, everyone, author of the 50th anniversary edition of Diet for a Small Planet. Get the book. That's my only message. Even if you have read the original Diet for a Small Planet or the 10th anniversary edition or the 20th, you need to have the 50th in your collection. It has everything in it. And it's so important that all of us have this information close at hand. Okay, everybody, thanks for joining me today on this very special program. I'm Karen Hartglass. You've been listening to It's All About Food. You can find me at responsibleeatingandliving.com. Send your comments and email to info at realmeals.org. And have a delicious week. <laughs>